Hello my friend, and welcome to the study, where today we're going to be talking about kingfishers, very colourful birds that have a large beak and live near the water in the family Alcadinidae. There are over 114 species of kingfisher. We will be looking at the small one that lives in Britain and Europe. He's a delightful little fellow, very brightly colored very distinctive markings. This particular species is the Alcado athis. He's a smallish bird with a stocky little body, a large dark bill. Upper parts are blue and gleaming turquoise. Some electric blue colors there. His underparts are orange, reddish, and chestnut color. The flight is arrow like, direct, and he often perches on lookout posts over the water. His habitat is clear streams and rivers, especially with steep banks. They eat small fish, aquatic insect larvae, and tadpoles. And they build their nests in holes in steep banks. And are these beautiful colors and his ability to under the water and come out flying that makes this bird a very interesting one for us to look at today. So I'm going to start by reading you a story from the book Père Castor called Martin Pêcheur with the help of my friend, the French Whisperer. Whose channel you can see in the comments. And there will also be a link. Then, I paint a kingfisher for you and tell you the story of Alcyon and Saix, the Greek myth of the kingfisher. So make yourself comfortable and let's enjoy kingfishers together. Let's start with a story, a lovely story, in this book called Martin Pêcheur, or Kingfisher in French. This is from the series Du Père Castor, published by Flammarion. And you might recognize the illustrator, Fyodor Rojankovsky, about whom I did a video in my Artists and Illustrators series. But you can hopefully see the link right there. 
this book is a beautiful story about the kingfishers, but it's in French. So joining me will be the French Whisperer. And if you don't already know his channel, I've put a link just there and also in the video description below. So together we'll be reading and I will translate into English selections from this story about the Kingfisher on the river. Because I thought the French was so beautiful that it deserved to be heard. So here you see the beautiful drawings by Rozhankovsky. We have a little stream flowing in the woods. And here between two trees this jolly little stream bubbles out. And the story is told in the first person by someone who passes along this wildlife area over the little white bridge and all of the things that he sees in the spring, the beaver dams, the otters, the frogs, the grass, stones and feathers, and little creatures going about to their business. Here we have a little fish. Tiny little fish and plants and a moor hen laying her eggs in her nest. Some frogs and a little crayfish crevette and little insects. more aquatic water birds, a family of owls. All of these animals and creatures that depend on the stream and the wetland to live. Different kinds of eel and how their fins sparkle in the flowing water. One day, I was walking along. J'étais absorbé par cet extraordinaire spectacle quand un frôlement d'ailes, un éclair bleu, me tirèrent de ma contemplation. Je restais saisi d'émerveillement pour la première fois. Un Martin Pêcheur venait de traverser mon royaume. D'où venait cet oiseau plus bleu que le ciel, plus brillant que la soie Je ne l'ai jamais su. Il avait dû errer longtemps avant que la chanson de mon ruisseau l'attira. I was so absorbed in the spectacle of nature, and suddenly, a flutter of wings, and a flash of blue drew me out of my reverie. I stopped, seized with amazement. For the first time, a kingfisher has come in to my realm. Where did this bird come from? More blue, more radiant 
and silk, more blue than the sky. I would never know. He tarried for a long time along my path and the stream. that he was attracted to. And all summer long, I watched Martin, Pêcheur, and his kingfisher activities, how he met his mate, who I named Martine, And their activities along the little stream. I identified all the creatures and the fish. Catfish, trout and perch. Tadpoles and other birds. And every year, every summer, I would watch my kingfishers, Martin and Martine, make their nest. And I looked forward to seeing them every spring when they would return. And here they're building their nest in the riverbank, far, far in, where they lay their little eggs. And the peaceful little stream that flows under the white bridge where they catch fish. And remain season after season, devoted to each other. I watched the activities of the frog and the crayfish as they would build their homes in the spring and raise their young and disappear in the winter either in hibernation or migration, and every spring how they would return to my beautiful little valley with the jolly stream. And on summer nights you could hear the frogs, and the otter, and the owl, and the birds in their nests, and the little voles by the side of the river would swim and go about their business. And there is Martine sitting on her eggs and Martin brings her fish to eat. Sometimes he catches big dragonflies or other insects. What a lovely pair of birds to watch as year after year they return to raise their little families of brilliant blue kingfishers in the river habitat that so many creatures call home. And this is when the rains come and the winter and snow covers the countryside and there are Martin and Martine. In 
in the winter when the snow covers the little valley. In a carpet of white and the water is frozen and the leaves are gone from the trees. With the rains of autumn, the kingfishers can soon no longer fish and so they part for southern warmer climates always to return to my valley again in the spring. Un jour, hélas, Martin est tombé malade. C'était un jour brumeux d'automne. Je regardais mélancoliquement les feuilles jaunies qu'emportait le courant. Quand un triste cri me fit sursauter. CX, CX, pauvre Martine. Elle ne sait plus quoi faire. Elle se pose à côté de lui. Elle déchire le poisson avec son bec et en met un tout petit morceau dans le bec de Martin. CX, CX. One day, alas, Martin fell ill. It was a misty autumn day. And I watched with melancholy as the yellow leaves floated away on the current of the stream. And there was a sad cry. Sakes, sakes. And there was Martin, perched there at the bottom of a branch. Sakes, sakes. Poor Martine. She didn't know what to do. She sat next to him. She brought him a fish. And with her beak, put a tiny little piece into his beak. Sakes, Sakes was the cry of the kingfisher. And there's Martin trying to feed him, but he wouldn't eat. And one day I found him, his poor little body. So I buried him next to the stream where I knew He had been happy. Quelques jours plus tard, j'entends de nouveau ce cri triste. CX, CX. Je ne vois pas Martine, mais je sais que c'est elle qui pleure. Oui, c'est elle. Tels sont l'amour et la fidélité des Martins pêcheurs que si l'un meurt, L'autre ne peut lui survivre. Il cherche la solitude. Il ne vole plus, ne mange plus, jusqu'au jour où son cœur cesse de battre. A few days later, I heard a new sad cry. Sakes, sakes. I couldn't see Martine, but I knew that it was her. Who was crying? Where was she? Such is the love and loyalty of the kingfishers, who, when one of them dies, the other cannot survive them. They seek out solitude. They fly no more. They eat no more until the day that their heart ceases to beat. And so it happened with Martine. After four or five days, I heard, Sakes! Sakes! And then, nothing more. I looked everywhere, Finally, I found the body of Martine, 
lie entombed with her Martin. A very sad day. But winter passed. Le printemps suivant, je reviens au petit pont blanc. De loin, je vois briller un grand miroir d'eau. Quelle surprise Tout le vallon est inondé, le ruisseau a débordé. Jamais il n'a été aussi gai, jamais il n'a couru aussi vite. Le ciel s'y mire tout entier. On dirait que les nuages du printemps se promènent sur la lande. Des chatons gris pendent aux branches des saules. Partout scintillent les boutons d'or. Au milieu de toute cette vie nouvelle, je pense tristement à mes martins pêcheurs, quand tout à coup, frrr, frrr, comme un éclair, deux paires d'ailes bleues passent sous le pont en rasant l'eau. Deux martins pêcheurs, d'un bleu éclatant, se perchent sur une branche. Ce sont peut-être les enfants de Martin et Martine qui reviennent à leur ruisseau natal Je ne sais pas, je ne sais rien d'eux, mais je suis heureuse, la vie recommence toujours. The following spring, and I returned to the little white bridge. Where shone a brilliant reflection on the water. The entire valley was flooded, overflowing, busy with life. A great mirror of water. Never had I seen it so cheerful and happy or flowing so fast. It reflected the sky entirely with the clouds and blue. They were the clouds that brought the rains of spring and the cattails were beginning to grow by the side of the river and the pussy willows and life began to return to the bare branches of the trees everywhere sparkled like little balls of gold in the middle of all of this new life I thought sadly about my kingfishers when all of a sudden Like a flash, two pairs of blue wings flew under the bridge, skimming the water. Two kingfishers in brilliant, radiant blue flew past and perched on a branch. Were they perhaps the children of Martin and Martine? I don't know. I don't know anything about them. But I was happy. Because in the spring, life always begins again. I hope you have enjoyed the story of the kingfisher, Martin Pêcheur. 
and the very generous reading the French by the French Whisperer. There is a precedent for the story of the Kingfisher in Greek mythology. So, I would like to tell you the story of Alcyon and Saix. But I'll do that nice and quietly whilst I paint a Kingfisher for you. So let's paint. I didn't put this on time-lapse because I wanted you to have the sounds of the brush and the paper and the water and also because I want to spend time with you so in order to be able to paint a kingfisher for you without taking several hours I've been practicing and timing myself painting birds. And consequently, some of them have come out um, downright pathetic, but um, Others uh, have turned out really quite mediocre, so I shall aspire to mediocrity to paint for you a kingfisher whilst I tell you the story, the Greek myth of Alcyon and sakes. So I've drawn a little kingfisher here, which we will paint. I'm going to use my portable paint set. that has little sponges for water wells and also a little reservoir for water and a brush so you can use it to paint while you're out to paint pictures of birds, wildlife, architecture, buildings and I've got a few brushes here. You can hear the wooden handles. Kingfishers belong to the taxonomic family Alcadinidae named by Constantin Samuel Raffinesque in 1815 after the story of the Halcyon, a mythical kingfisher-like bird. Recounts of the myth of Alcyon and Saix can be found in the works of Ovid, Hyginus, and Virgil. Ovid and Hyginus both make this myth the origin of the etymology for the term Halcyon Days, the seven days in winter when storms never occur. Originally, the fourteen days each year, seven days on either side of the winter solstice, during which Halcyon, transformed into a kingfisher, laid her eggs and made her nest, and during which her father Aeolus, god of the winds, restrained the storms and calmed the waves for her safety. Today, this term refers to a peaceful time or a happy interval set in the midst of adversity. 
so I did have a little trouble with the camera. So the first part, the little kingfisher I was painting for you, I've done the wash on already, you can see. But uh, the rest of it, you'll get to watch me paint. The English poet Robert Graves further explains that the legend refers to the birth of the new sacred king at the winter solstice, after the queen who represents his mother, the moon goddess, has conveyed the old king's corpse to a sepulchral island. But because the winter solstice does not always coincide with the same phase of the moon, every year must be understood as every great year of one hundred lunations, in the last of which solar and lunar time were roughly synchronized and the sacred king's term ended. The story of Martin and Martine was inspired by the myth of Alcyon and Saix, or Alcyon, as was Maurice Ravel's beautiful music, which you heard at the beginning of this video. Alcyon, composed in 1902 for soprano, alto, tenor and orchestra for the Prix de Rome competition. The Myth of Alcyon, from a translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Saix, son of the morning star, ruled without force or shedding blood, his face filled with his father's radiance. Alcyon was the daughter of Aeolus, king of the Aeolian islands, and the ruler of the winds. Troubled in his heart, mourning the loss of his brother dead in Leon, Saix prepared to go and consult the sacred oracle of Apollo at Claros, but the infamous Borbus, leader of the Phlegians, had made Delphi inaccessible by land, so he determined to reach it by sea. Before he set out, he discussed it with his faithful Alcyon. Hearing her husband's plan, Alcyon felt a chill, and her face grew boxwood pale, tears flowing down her cheeks. Three times she tried to speak. Three times her face was wet with weeping and sobs interrupting her pleas to Saix. What sin of mine has turned your mind to this, dear one? Where is that care for me that used to come first? Can you now leave Alcyon behind without a thought? Does it please you now to travel far? Am I dear to you away from you? But I suppose your way is overland, and I shall only grieve, not fear for you. My anxieties will be free from terror. But Saix told her he was going by sea, and she said, The waters scare me, and the somber face of the deep, and lately I saw wrecked timbers on the shore, and I have often read the names on empty tombs. Do not allow your mind to acquire false confidence, because Aeolus is your father-in-law, who keeps the strong winds imprisoned, and, when he wishes, calms the sea. When once the winds are released and hold sway over the waters, nothing can oppose them. They vex the clouds in the sky and create the red lightning flashes from their fierce collisions. But if no prayers can alter your purpose, dear one, husband, if you are fixed on going, take me with you. Then we shall be storm-tossed together. At least I shall know what I fear. Together we shall bear whatever comes. Together we shall be borne over the waters. The star-born husband was moved by Aeolius's daughter's words and tears, but he would not relinquish his planned sea journey, nor did he want to put Alcyon in peril. His anxious heart tried to comfort her with many words, yet, despite that, he could not. He added one solace, the only one that moved his lover. Every delay will seem long to us indeed, but I swear to you by my father's light to return to you as long as the fates allow it, before the moon has twice completed her circle.
When her hopes had been revived by these promises of return, he immediately ordered the ship to be dragged down the slipway and launched into the sea. Alcyon, seeing this, as if she foresaw what was to come, gave way to a flood of tears. She hugged Saix, and, in misery, said a last farewell. With Saix on board, the young crew, double-ranked, pulled on their oars with deep-chested strokes, and cut the water with their rhythmic blows. Alcyon raised her wet eyes, and leaning forward could see her husband standing on the curved after-deck, waving his hand, and she returned the signal. When he was farther from the shore, and she could no longer recognize his features, she followed the fleeting ship with her gaze while she could. Even when that was too far off to be seen, she still could see the topsails unfurling from the masthead. When no sails could be seen, and heavy of heart, she sought out the empty bedroom and threw herself onto the bed. The room and the bed provoked more tears and reminded her of her absent love. The ship had left the harbour, and the breeze was stirring the rigging. The captain shipped the oars, ran the yard up to the top of the mast, and put on all sail to catch the freshening breeze. The ship was cutting through the waves, no more than midway across, maybe less, far from either shore, when, at nightfall, the sea began to whiten with swelling waves, and the east wind to blow with greater strength. The captain shouted, lower the yards, and close reef all sails. But the wind drowned his orders, and his voice could not be heard above the breaking seas. Yet some of the crew, on their own initiative, removed the oars. Some bailed, and others secured the spars. The storm increased its severity, and the roaring winds attacked from every quarter, stirring the angry waves. The captain himself was fearful, the weight of destruction so much more powerful than his skill. Through the uproar, men shouting, the rigging straining, the sound of breaking sea, and the crash of thunder, the waves rose up and seemed to form the sky themselves, and their spray touched the lowering clouds. The water was tainted yellow with sand churned up from the depths, then blacker than the sticks, while the waves broke white with hissing foam. The Trachinian ship was driven in the grip of fate, now lifted on high as if looking down on the valleys from a mountain summit into the depths of Acheron, now sinking, caught in the trough of a wave, staring at heaven from the infernal pool. Again and again the force of the flood struck the sides with a huge crash, sounding no lighter a blow than when an iron ram or ballista strikes a damaged fortress. As fierce lions on the attack drive themselves onto the armoured chests and extended spears of hunters, so the waves drove forward in the rising winds, reaching the height of the ship and higher above it. And then the wooden wedges gave way, and stripped of their wax covering, cracks appeared offering the lethal waves a passage. Look how the heavy rain falls from the melting clouds, and you would think all of heaven was emptying into the sea, and the sea was filling the heavenly zones. The sky was starless, and the murky night full of its own, and the storm's gloom. Flashes of lightning cleaved it, the rain illuminated by the lightning flares. Then the sea poured into the ship's hollow hull as well. As a soldier, more outstanding than the rest, who had often tried to scale the battlement of a besieged city, succeeded at last and fired with a love of glory, took the wall one man in a thousand. So when the waves have battered nine times against the steep sides of the ship, the tenth wave, surging with greater impetus, rushed on 
and did not cease its assault on the beleaguered craft until it had breached the conquered vessel's defenses. So one part of the sea was still trying to take the ship, and the other part was already inside. All was confusion, as a city is confused when some are undermining the walls from outside, while others hold them from within. Skill failed, and courage ebbed, and as many separate deaths as advancing waves seemed to rush upon them and burst over them. Some could not hold their tears, some were stupefied, and others cried out that they are fortunate whom proper burial rites await. Yet another worshipped the gods in prayer, and lifting his arms in vain to the sky he could not see, begged for help. Some thought of fathers and brothers, some of home and children, or whatever they had left behind. But it is Alcyon that moves Saix. Nothing but Alcyon was on Saix's lips, and though he only longed for her, he rejoiced that she was not there. How he would like to have seen his native shores again, and turn his last gaze towards his home. But he no longer knew where it was. The sea swirled in such vortices, and the covering shadows of pitch-black clouds so hid the sky that it was night. The mast and rudder were shattered by the onset of a storm-driven whirlwind. One ultimate wave, like a conqueror delighting in his spoils, reared up, gazing down at the other waves, and, as if one tore Pindus and Athos from their base and threw them utterly into the open sea, it fell headlong, and the weight and the impulse together drove the ship to the bottom. The majority of the crew met their fate with the ship, driven down by the mass of water, never to return to the light. The rest clung to broken pieces of the vessel. Saix himself held on to a fragment of the wreck with a hand more used to holding a scepter, and called on his father, the morning star, and his father-in-law, Aeolus, but alas, in vain, mostly it was Alcyon's name on his lips. He thought of her and spoke to her and prayed that the waves might carry his body to her sight, and that, lifeless, he might be entombed by her dear hands. While he could swim, and as often as the waves allowed him to open his mouth, he spoke the name of Alcyon, far off until the waves themselves murmured it. Then a black arc of water broke over the heart of the sea, and the bursting wave buried his drowning head. The morning star was indistinct and not to be seen that dawn, and since he was not allowed to leave the sky, he covered his face in dense cloud. Meanwhile, Alcyon, Aeolus' daughter, was counting the nights, unaware of this great misfortune, quickly weaving clothes for him to wear and for herself, for when he returned, promising herself the homecoming that will not be. She piteously offered incense to all the gods, but worshipped mostly at Juno's temple, coming to the altars for a man who was no more, hoping her husband were safe and would soon be returning to her, preferring her above any other woman. Of all her prayers, only this last one could be granted. The goddess could no longer bear these appeals for one who was dead, and to free her altar from those inauspicious hands, she said, Iris, most faithful carrier of my words, go quickly to the heavy halls of sleep, and order him to send Alcyon a dream figure in the shape of her dead Saix to tell her his true fate. As she spoke, Iris donned her thousand-colored robe, and, tracing her watery bow on the sky, she searched out, as ordered, the palace of that king, Sleep, hidden under cloud. There is a deeply cut cave, a hollow mountain near the Cimmerian country, 
the house and sanctuary of drowsy sleep. Phoebus can never reach it with his dawn, midday, or sunset rays. Clouds mixed with fog and shadows of the half-light are exhaled from the ground. No waking cockerel summons Aurora with his crowing. No dog disturbs the silence with its barking. No goose with its cackling. No beasts or cattle or branches in the breeze. No clamor of human tongues. There still silence dwells, but out of the stony depths flows Lath's stream, whose waves, sliding over those pebbles with their murmur, induce drowsiness. In front of the cave mouth a wealth of poppies flourish, and innumerable herbs from whose juices dew-wet night gathers sleep and scatters it over the darkened earth. There are no doors in this palace, lest a turning hinge creak, and no guard at the threshold. But in the cave's centre there is a tall bed made of ebony, downy, black-hued, spread with a dark grey sheet, where the god himself lies, his limbs relaxed in slumber. Around him, here and there, lie uncertain dreams, taking different forms, as many as the ears of corn at harvest, as the trees bear leaves, or as grains of sand are thrown ashore. When the nymph entered, and with her hands brushed aside the dreams in her way, the sacred place shone with the light of her robes. The god, hardly able to lift his eyes heavy with sleep, at last shook himself free of his own influence and resting on an elbow asked her, for he knew her, why she had come. And she replied, Sleep, the rest of all things, sleep, the gentlest of gods, the spirit's peace, from whom care flies, who soothes the body, wearied with toil, and readies it for fresh labours. Sleep, order a likeness that mirrors his true form, and let it go the image of King Saix to Alcyon in Trachin of Hercules and depict a phantasm of the wreck. This Juno commands. After she had completed her commission, Iris departed, no longer able to withstand the power of sleep and, feeling the drowsiness steal over her body, she fled and recrossed the arch by which she had lately come. From a throng of a thousand sons, his father roused Morpheus, a master craftsman and simulator of human forms. No one else is as clever at expressing the movement, the features, and the sound of speech. He depicts the clothes and the usual accents. He alone imitates human beings. A second son becomes beast or bird or long snake's body. The gods call him Icolos, the mortal crowd Phobitor, the third of diverse artistry, is Phantasos. He takes illusory shapes of all inanimate things, earth, stones, rivers, trees. These are the ones that show themselves by night to kings and generals. The rest wander among citizens and commoners. Old Somnus passed them by choosing one of all these brothers, Morpheus, to carry out the command of Iris, daughter of Thaumas, and relaxing again into sweet drowsiness, his head drooped, and he settled into his deep bed. Flying through the shadows on noiseless wings, Morpheus, after a short delay, came to the Haemonian city. Shedding his wings, he took the shape of Saix, pallid like the dead and naked, and stood before his unfortunate wife's bed. He appeared with sodden beard and seawater dripping from his matted hair. Then he bent over her pillow with tears streaming down his face and said, My poor wife, do you know your poor sakes? Or has my face altered in death? 
look at me, you will recognize me, and find for a husband a husband's shade. Your prayers have brought me no help, Alcyon. I am dead. Do not hold out false hopes of my return. Storm-laden austere, the southern wind, caught the ship in Aegean waters, and tossed in tempestuous blasts, wrecked her there. My lips, calling helplessly on your name, drank the waves. No dubious author announces this news for you, nor do you hear it as a vague report. I myself, drowned as you see me before you, tell you my fate. Get up, act, shed tears, wear mourning. Do not let me go down unwept to Tartarus's void. Morpheus spoke these words in a voice she would believe to be her husband's. The tears that he wept also seemed real tears, and his hands revealed Saix's gestures. Alcyon cried, stirring her arms in sleep, and seeking his body, grasped only air and cried out, Wait for me. Where do you vanish? We will go together. Roused by her own voice and her husband's image, she started up out of sleep. First she gazed round to see if he was still there, the one she had just seen. At the sound of her cry the servants brought a lamp. She shouted at her nurse, who asked the cause of her grief. Alcyon is nothing, is nothing. She has died together with her sex. Be done with soothing words. He is wrecked. I saw him. I knew him. I stretched out my hands towards him as he vanished eager to hold him back. It was a shadow, yet it was my husband's true shadow made manifest. But pallid and naked with dripping hair, I, the unfortunate one, saw him. Look, my poor husband stood on that very spot, and she tried to find a trace of his footprints. This is what I feared, with my divining mind, this and I begged you not to leave me chasing the winds, but for certain I should have desired you to take me with you since you were going to your death. How good it would have been to have gone with you, then no part of my life would have lacked your presence, nor would we be separated by death. Now I have died absent from myself, and am thrown through the waves absently, and the sea takes me without me. My mind would treat me more cruelly than the sea if I should try to live on and fight to overcome my sorrow. But I shall not fight, nor leave you, my poor husband, and at least now I shall come as your companion. Grief choked further words, and lamentation took their place, wholly, and sighs drawn from a stricken heart. Morning had broken. She went out of the house towards the shore, sadly seeking the place where she had watched him depart. And while she stayed there, and while she was saying, here he loosed the rope, on this strand he kissed me as he left, and while she recalled the significant actions by their locations and looked seawards, she saw in the flowing waves what looked like a body, unsure at first what it was. After the tide had brought it a little nearer, though it was some way off, it was clearly a body. She did not know whose it was, but was moved by the omen of this shipwrecked man, and as if she wept for the unknown dead, she cried out, Alas for you, poor soul, whoever you may be, and your wife, if you have one. The body had been washed near the sea, and the more she gazed at it, the smaller and smaller shrank her courage. Now it was close to land, now she could see who it was. It was her husband. She cried out, It's him, and she stretched out her trembling hands to Saix, saying, Oh, is it like this, dear husband? Is it like this you return to me? A breakwater, built by the waves, broke the initial force of the sea and weakened the onrush of the tide. Though it was amazing that she could do so, she leapt on to it, and flew, and, beating the soft air on newfound wings, a sorrowing bird, she skimmed the surface of the waves. 
As she flew, her plaintive voice came from a slender beak, like someone grieving and full of sorrows. When she reached the mute and bloodless corpse, she clasped the dear limbs with her new wings and kissed the cold lips in vain with her hard beak. People doubted whether Saix felt this, or merely seemed to raise his face by a movement of the waves, but he did feel it, and at last, through the gods' pity, both were changed to birds, the halcyons. Though they suffered the same fate, their love remained, and their bonds were not weakened by their feathered form. They mate and rear their young, and Alcyon broods on her nest for seven calm days in the winter time, floating on the water's surface. Then the waves are stilled, Aeolus imprisons the winds and forbids their roaming, and controls his grandson's waves. So as the beautiful turquoise blue colors of this kingfisher are materializing on the paper, I hope you have enjoyed watching me paint and listening to the stories read by me and by the French Whisperer. And uh, if you would like to watch me paint with a little bit of music I had playing in the background and no talking, please let me know in the comments. And um, I will post a video of me painting another kingfisher. <laughs> As I finish this, I will again uh, put on the recording I took of my pond fountain with all the birds singing. As it uh, reminds me a lot of the kingfisher being next to the flowing water. If you've enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or suggestions, please leave a comment. And I hope you're very relaxed. Be good to yourself. Be kind to others. And as always, be extraordinary. Martin Pêcheur, d'un bleu éclatant.
se perchent sur une branche. Ce sont peut-être les enfants de Martin et Martine qui reviennent à leur ruisseau natal. Je ne sais pas, je ne sais rien d'eux, mais je suis heureuse, la vie recommence toujours.